you know, we're we're obviously continuing uh, to play halfway decent basketball, and it's good to play well and win. Uh, it's never fun to play well and lose, um, but uh, but that's part of the journey and part of what we sign up for, which is what I've continued to say. It's a 31-game season. It's not a one-week, one-day, one-game. Uh, and uh, taking on challenges and seeing how young people react and um, and grow and embrace and don't run away from the fire. Uh, that's why I do what I do, and I'm really enjoying this team right now. Frank, could you give us an update on Key, Moss, and Hannibal? Yeah, Moss is fine. Moss had a uh, Moss had a death in the family. And uh, um, uh, Trey's uh, swelling from his ankle uh, went down considerably. Um, uh, but he still had pain as of last night. I haven't checked this morning. Um, as far as trying to do a calf raise on that, it's his left ankle, I believe. Uh, trying to do a calf raise on his left ankle. Um, so we're still up in the air there. Uh, and then Keyshawn uh, with head injuries, you know, he, it's improved. I mean, he, he didn't get into the whole um, throwing up and unconscious. When, when you get into that episode, that complicates things. Uh, he did not. So uh, with those head injuries, it's, uh, uh, it's more of a day-to-day um, kind of thing. And uh, if you remember last year, he missed some time with uh, – he suffers from these uh, intense migraines. And uh, uh, so this kind of flared that up. So we'll see. I don't have a clear answer for you on him. Hey, Frank, this, this fight that the team has shown, is that something that can be learned, you think, from, from you? Or is that something that these guys kind of came in with, you think? Um, I think it's got to, you got to have, I told you guys a couple of weeks ago when I was frustrated with the personality uh, uh, that our team was lacking. Uh, I think it's an intrinsic thing, um, but sometimes it's in there. You just need people to help that flame burn a little bigger. And I think that's what Jermaine's doing for us right now. Um, um, it's, uh, if the coach has to burn the flame, Got no chance. Um, it's, uh, uh, but I think it's it's got to be intrinsic. It, it, there's no way that you learn to be competitive uh, at the age of 18, 19, 20 by external reasons. Or you know, it's. Uh, I, I'm I'm a big believer. If you don't have that competitive bug in you by the age of 18, 19, 20, it's going to be hard. Uh, to, to build it then. Um, so we've got guys that have it. Uh, we just had no personality. So, you know, Jermaine, Jermaine's giving us that. And, um, uh, and sometimes uh, amongst your peers, uh, that, that, that when someone's willing to do it, it, it helps your fire burn a little, little bigger than it did before. You know, Coach, throughout the season, it's been different players at different times leading the way. Just with Jermaine the last couple of games, just how much do you want to see him continue to be that consistent guy? Because I feel like for you guys to continue to take the next steps, it'd be nice to at least have one or two guys every game you can really look at and say, that's going to be my guy I can count on. Yeah, the, the what Jermaine brings to the table is pretty consistent. I mean, uh, um, not this past summer, the summer before when he first got here, uh, uh, there was an open gym and some of old guys were here and guys from around town that were here for the summer were here. And um, and Sin and PJ and them came in the office and said, yo, that new guy going to be all right. And I said, why you guys say that? He said, because he wasn't having it from anybody. And uh, I don't – take much as far as who's playing well and who's not playing well from open gyms. Uh, obviously, I'm not allowed to sit in there and watch. But when two guys, you know, that 
one's a ferocious competitor in Cinderius, and the other one's quiet, but he's got a competitive bug in him in PJ. Uh, come in and tell you that that guy's going to be all right because of the fact that he's in a summer pickup game and he's not taking crap from anybody. Um, that tells me a lot about what he was about. So uh, we, we, you know, but but he's going through it for the first time. So it's it's hard hard to lead others when you're trying to figure it out yourself. And I think he he uh, um, when he hurt his back there and, and and missed those four or five days. Um, I haven't asked him this, but I think sitting back and watching us lose to Florida really bothered him. And uh, knowing of the way he and we played against Stetson uh, just kind of put him in a place where he said, all right, enough's enough. And and he's been great. I mean, he his willingness to lead, uh, to demand of teammates has been great. Uh, but he's a freshman, so I can't put – I can't put everything in his basket, you know. He he needs some of uh, uh, some of the other guys to help. But that's where that's where now Mike becomes even more valuable, because um, now Jermaine's willing to take a stance from a uh, voice standpoint to demand that others do what they're supposed to do, and then Mike's there to back him up with his effort and every day. And Justin and and Mike and Justin are. are they're tremendous pieces for a successful team. Uh, it, it's just they're not the kind of guys that just make others do what they're supposed to do. Jermaine is. And so now I don't think it's any surprise that all of a sudden Jermaine has played well and you see Justin playing that much better. I, I, don't, I think that goes hand in hand. You uh, sat Bolden for the Kentucky game. Excuse me, what's your name, sir? Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> anyway, um, you sat Bolden for the Kentucky game, and then he has a good game for you uh, last time out. In your experience as a coach, what is it that a player does or does not do that will lead you to uh, – and I'm talking about a guy who's been a contributor – lead you to sit him for an entire game? And then how do you feel when that player, like Bolden did, bounces back and gives you a <clears throat> really good outing the next time out? I'll answer the second part. I, I, I feel really good when they bounce back and handle things the right way and come back and perform and don't pout, um, which is what he did. And that's why in my press conference, as soon as the game ended, I believe that's the first thing I said um, uh, about him and, and AJ, who had not been playing well. Um, and uh, uh, to have both of those guys uh, put us in a place where we can go win, I thought was great. Um, I I don't have a set. Hey, hey, here, here's the beauty about teaching, coaching, whatever word you want to use for what I do. Uh, there's not a book with a chapter and a page number that you go find a word and it gives you the definition of how to handle that moment. Um, you handle everyone differently. It, it, there, it, it's, I don't have a, uh, a set expectation for everybody that's one in the same it's my job is to manage my players as they are as people not based on points per game and rebounds per game and wins and losses all that to me is irrelevant uh, if I were to manage people on points per game maybe I should have benched Justin when he didn't score a basket for a couple games I, I don't do that uh, I, I my my uh, my job is to manage them individually, and and uh, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I can tell you this. So I don't wake up in the mornings and I say that guy's really pissing me off. I can't wait to see him and bench him and embarrass him. I, it, that's the last thing. Anytime I speak to young people, I make them understand that my whole life being around coaches and teachers, I've never once heard a teacher or coach wake w walk into a meeting and say. I can't stand that guy. I can't wait to make him worse. Never, not once. On the contrary, I don't care how bad students or players are. What frustrates teachers and coaches is when we're not able to reach them. We continue to try to figure out a way to reach them. And, um, and that's, that's what I – when I speak to young people, that's all I speak about. 
because that's the truth. Uh, and we don't make decisions based on wins and losses. Uh, uh, but I don't have a set pattern as to, well, uh, he acted a certain way for two days, so I'm going to bench him this game. No, I, I make decisions on, on what's best for our team to win that next day. And, and I make decisions based on uh, my relationship with those players individually. I, I have a, a set of rules that everyone's going to be held accountable to. I'm not a big rules guy because when you have a lot of rules, it looks good on paper, but you're not managing rules, you manage people. Uh, so if you have a bunch of rules, you're going to end up in a bad place with people. So I've got a set of rules that those guys know what they are, and if they violate any of those, then that's a different animal. But I, my job's to manage people, and I manage everyone individually. I don't. Uh, it doesn't mean because you average 20, uh, I treat you differently than if you average two. No, I'm gonna treat everyone the same from an accountability standpoint. But I manage them as people based on who they are and how they uh, react better. Uh, and with Jair, I just. I just thought other guys deserved to play, and he had been playing, and uh, and for whatever reason, uh, he what I was asking and what he was doing was not connecting. So I tried someone else. Uh, a follow up on Jair: what what did you notice about him during the Kentucky game? His attitude on the bench, and then how did he respond in those days following practice? Obviously, pretty well to get back into the game. Uh, the next day, but what what did you kind of notice out of him that that prompted you to to get him back in there? Some, I, he he was involved in practice like he usually is. Uh, I, I thought he was a little more aggressive in practice, um, and uh, uh, I mean, didn't take a rocket scientist to understand that he was probably going to play against Texas A and M because of personnel. Um, um, and give him credit. He was ready to go. And, and then he went out there and he was aggressive. Uh, um, and then he, you know, if, if you remember correctly, he, we're attacking their press and he pops up to where we want and he makes a three right away. Then he comes down, shoots an air ball, missed the rim by six feet. And he came down and got beat off the dribble like if he wasn't even there. And I dug into him a little bit. And he responded. And... Uh, uh, he 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 was aggressive. He was engaged. Um, and when I mean aggressive, I'm not talking about the ball going in the basket. I'm talking about he had six assists. You know, it's it's it's. I mean, he he wasn't just holding the ball. He was trying to get the ball into places and and shooting it when he was open and when not open, making a play for someone else. And um, um, so um, I st he needs to defend better. I don't I, he. Some of our bigs picked up fouls trying to protect him defensively uh, during the course of that game, and he's got to do a better job defensively. Uh, but uh, he's a good dude. Uh, Jair's a really good guy. He's a good teammate. Guys enjoy him. Um, it's it just we need him to be a little, little more excited about competing uh, under our parameters and maybe. Uh, what he had been, you know, and it's part of the growth, man. It's the way it works. Frank, uh, just this year across college basketball, we're probably seeing more parity and, and more, uh, you know, you, you don't really know who's dominant than any year that we've ever seen. Do you see your team kind of uh, living that reputation considering, uh, you know, you lost three straight, now you've won two in a row and things kind of seem to be gelling for you? Um, I, 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 I don't think our team uh, is any different than most teams in the country. Um, uh, when you're playing with a bunch of first-year guards and, and your second-year guards, A.J. Lawson, you only won. Um, should have been a college freshman this year. Um, and he's taken on a set of responsibilities that, that he had never – never been placed on his shoulders before. Uh, I think that uh, there's going to be um, uh, some inconsistencies uh, with how we played since um, basketball is a game of, of guard play. Um, uh, uh, you know, Dave, I, I, 
if you if you take December 30th and you put an X over it, okay, we've actually played really well. Even against Houston, I told you guys after the game, I thought we played hard enough to win. We just didn't make any shots. If we had shot the ball against Houston like we shot it the other day, maybe we win that game. Uh, but I thought we played well the month of December. And, uh, and I thought we've played well after December 30th. Uh, it's hard to convince people that you play well and lose. That's why I said what I said when I started. Because uh, 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 we all judge uh, based on the score, and I get it. Uh, I don't need people to explain to me how my job works. The idea is to win, not lose. Uh, but uh, privately, uh, I'm, I'm into seeing guys grow up, seeing guys get better. Uh, I think seeing Mike Coatsar, the, the way he's playing his senior year, that's what drives me into coaching. That's – that's. Uh, um, and I've, I've tried to explain this in the past. And, and at the end, uh, if you want to – the day that they call me up and say, hey, Frank, uh, it's time for you to go fly a kite, um, I'll go fly my kite and I'll be real happy. Um, and if all people can do is talk about how many wins and losses I had, that's going to be a sad day for me flying that kite by myself. Uh, but if at the end of the day, uh, when I'm flying that kite, uh, the conversation is about how many people were impacted in positive ways and how many su successful men got put into society. Then I'm going to have a lot of people hanging out with me when I'm flying that kite. And that's kind of the way what I worry about. Um, Phil, you're welcome to come when I'm flying that kite, by the way. <laughs> you don't show up to my games and my press conferences, but, but, but you're more than welcome to be when I'm out there with that kite. Frank, I guess what were conversations like with AJ these last couple weeks with him trying to kind of figure out his offensive game and what did you see from him against Texas A&M? Positive, man. He's a big-time kid. It's uh, Have I been frustrated that he hasn't played better? Of course I have. It's my job. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he's dealing with a uh, an expectation on his shoulder that he's never had before. Um, and he's only going to get better and grow because of this. And it's my job. Uh, he's got it in him. It's my job to demand that he doesn't run away from it and help him when he falls down. That's kind of uh, what my job is. And, and, uh, and it's his job that when he does fall down, figure out a way to get back up. And he's doing that. You know, he's a young buck. He's a... Uh, uh, he's got a wonderful heart, wonderful spirit. Um, uh, all this is all this is really good for him. He's going to grow up because of all this. Uh, um, you know, last year he had cover. Last year he had a fifth year, two fifth year senior guards, and Chris Silva. He had cover. You don't have cover this year. It's it's on his shoulders, and and he hasn't run away from it. Um, he he. Uh, uh, that's why I was so happy with how he played when he went back in there against A and M. Because he could have been passive. He had four fouls. He could have said, "All right, I, let me kind of be careful." He was real aggressive defensively, and then offensively, he was on. He started that game on the word "go," offensively, and just you know, started picking up fouls. And um, but and, you know, and, the, and then. The only bad play he made where he was just like, what are you doing, was that offensive foul against the press, which I, I, got, I got no idea what he was doing there. Uh, but, uh, but this is good. This is good. Dealing with adversity is good for people. It's not bad for people. Um, and this is, this, all this is really good for him. And, and seeing the way he handles it um, is even better. With another road game coming up, what has this team done well in other teams' gyms this year from your vantage point with a 4-1 and record? You get mad if I give you a smart you-know-what answer? Scored more points than them. <laughs> uh, uh, I, we, don't, we don't get wrapped up. I don't, I don't speak about home games and road games. I, I've never done it that way. I, I've never... I've never – the only thing that, that I ever might say 
is the game's a little more physical uh, when you go on the road than uh, against you than when you're at home. Um, but I don't, I don't, we don't talk about crowds. We don't talk about how many people in the building. We don't talk about any of that stuff. We talk about the game, the opponent, the personnel, style of play, uh, what we have to do and what we have to avoid doing uh, to, to figure out a way to win. And, uh, um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not big on all that. Uh, like, if I start bringing uh, conversations in front of the team, like, hey, you know, this arena's going to be packed and a lot of people and it's really loud, then what do you think they're going to be thinking of when we take the court? Oh, let me see these people. Wow, it is loud in here. It, it, I, I don't know. I've, I, I, I think if you go through my eight years here, and you check our road record, it's probably pretty good compared to the eight years before me. Uh, that would be a guess. I'm not into comparing to others, but uh, and if you go to our road record at K-State, it was pretty good. Um, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't differentiate how we prepare road or home. Uh, I was real proud of the guys, though, because I managed them a certain way uh, because we had a uh, um, because of travel and all that, noon game Saturday. So I'm going to backtrack for you. Noon game Saturday. Uh, so uh, we, we had to leave here no later than 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We ended up leaving like at 3.15 um, on Friday. So therefore, we had to practice Friday before class at 7 o'clock in the morning because if we would have practiced after classes ended, we wouldn't have left here till 6 o'clock. And I didn't want to get there too late with such an early game. So we went at 7 a.m. Since we were practicing at 7 a.m. and we had such a hard game against Kentucky the night before, uh, Thursday, uh, we, we coached them through their minds a lot more than physicality on the court. And with a young team, that's always a concern. They handled it like champs. They, 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 uh, we were really good Friday morning at practice and, uh, and obviously uh, uh, the, the level of competitiveness that we played with on Saturday was what you need to win. So, but I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer for you as far as why. I, I can just tell you how I do things and, and I think our team kind of follows that script pretty good. Coach, a good portion of this press conference has been centered around managing minds on your team. I'm just curious from your vantage point, how comfortable are you now with your players that you feel you can maximize their potential, just getting to know them through the ups and downs of this season moving forward? I know them better now than I did December 1st. I understand how they manage things better now than, than I did November 1st. Uh, that's why I sat here and told you guys before the season, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about the talent of the team. And I told you guys what I said, which I stand by. And I also told you the season will determine whether or not this team learns to win or learns to lose. Uh, we're still in the middle of that book. We're not, we're not, you know, if there's 30 chapters, we're not even, on, what are we, 10 and 17 chapters in. There's still 13 more to write, and, uh, or 14. Uh, so there, there's so much basketball to play, so many uh, moments to, to who knows what's in front of us from a winning, winning and losing, God forbid, injuries, um, all those things. We, I got no idea. You know, it's, uh, um, it takes a while to understand people. Uh, it really does. Uh, it took me three years to figure out my coats are. I still haven't figured him out, but I'm in a pretty good place with him right now and it has nothing to do with his production. It's just that uh, you, you try different things with people and you don't really uh, – the summer, September, May – well, not May, we're not school, May, April. Uh, there's no uh, – it's all about – seriously, you can't get along with somebody for, in, a, in a competitive world for two hours a week. You're not worth the dynamite it takes to blow you up. Think about it. That's how much time we get during that time of year, two hours. And if you can't be in a competitive environment for two hours a week and be a good citizen, like, you got some serious issues. 
And uh, uh, so it's really, really hard to figure it out, the managing of the minds and how people act and react and, uh, in the off season. You kind of figure all that out now when we're for that unbelievable amount of time, that 20 hours. You know how hard that is on these poor young kids, 20 hours a week. Jesus, God forbid that we do 21 hours a week. <laughs> You know, it, they'll never be normal human beings if we practice them 21 hours instead of 20. Um, um, it, but you don't figure it out until you get into this part of the season and you get the real, um, uh, especially now nowadays, so many outside influences um, where, where you're, you're trying to figure out how to get young people to manage that when they're actually out in front of everybody. Um, Playing basketball, winning and losing, and everything else that we get judged on. Frank, in a week's time, you know, Justin, that Tennessee doesn't score, but has a bunch of rebounds, blocks, guards. Jordan Bowden mm -hmm. kind of held him to that stat line he had. And then a week later, uh, after a good game against, against Kentucky, good finish against Kentucky, he has the game he has against Texas A&M. Those guys that that, where does he fit in category of players you've had that you can just kind of that glue guy type where. You know, they might not be the star, but you can always trust them. How important is that? And to see him, those shots go in, uh, how important is, is, that, is that for this team kind of going forward? Yeah, important for the team. It's huge. I mean, if you, you go through our season, um, we win at Virginia. He scores in double figures. Uh, you know, beat Kentucky. He scores in double figures in the second half. Uh, go on the road and beat A&M. He has 18. Uh, he's got to uh, – uh, when he produces – we actually play pretty good on offense. When I mean produces, I mean has stats offensively. Um, I think he also had a career high in assists or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Or I don't know. He had a good number of assists, maybe season high. Uh, had five assists. They, well, heck, when uh, when you make 16 threes, even the coach gets an assist. But uh, is anyone asking me about free throw shooting today? We were seven of eight, weren't we, Derek? Uh, is anyone going to ask me about if I practice free throws leading into that game? Uh, um, uh, but just, Justin brings – Justin's a, not a good, a great teammate. He brings a great energy every single day. He brings tremendous spirit every single day. He's just got to get to a place where he's at peace. He worries too much about the ball not going in. And all I keep telling them is, who cares if it does not go in? What's the worst that can happen, that we lose a game? Seriously, how lucky are we if that's the worst thing that ever happens to us? Don't worry about that. You do everything else. You're in the gym countless hours at night shooting balls. Let it go, man. Let it go. You did it your friend. Most guys struggle shooting as freshmen because it's a little harder than they thought it was. And the guys that work at it, they get better during their careers. The guys that don't, don't ever get better. I told him, I said, you shot 37 point something percent as a freshman. You're playing on a team that's got better guards right now. You've done this before. Be a piece, man. You put in the time. Just and and, um, But that's something he's got to manage himself. I, I, I can tell him whatever. I can rah-rah and Newt Rockney him to death. At the end of the day, he's got to believe when he jumps up, he's going to shoot that ball. It's going to go in and be at peace with it. And, um, and he, 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 he's too good a kid. Some guys like don't care because it's like, ah, he's too good a kid. He's worried about letting people down. He's got to not worry about that. You let people down when you don't put in the time. He's put in the time. Now he's got to just go out there and trust it. But we need him. We need him to win these kind of games. We need him to, uh, to give us an offensive identity. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like y'all played a little bit more zone against Texas A&M probably because of foul trouble and, and depth. And, and y'all have had to do that a couple of times this year. And it seems like your, your team's done that pretty well. Mm -hmm. Do you look at maybe incorporating some of that in, into uh, games regardless of foul trouble, um, you know, especially since you've kind of lamented that y'all have had trouble guarding the ball uh, at times as well? Yeah, John, it's uh... – and by the way, a lot of credit to Bruce Shingler because uh, we were in our uh, traditional 2-3 zone and uh, they kind of got into a little rhythm and were getting the ball into the high post against us. 
and it was hurting us. And and Bruce just stayed in my ear behind me, like go to the, our other zone, the three-two zone, to negate the high post entry. And he just I didn't do it the first two times he told me, but he just stayed in my ear. And I got tired of their high post guy catching it and beating us. So I said, all right, let's try it. And it worked. And uh, uh, so a lot of credit to him for helping me manage that moment of the game. Um, my, my, my belief the whole time, John, is that this team can be a pretty good zone team. That's been my belief the whole time. Uh, now we have uh, a short-term vision and we have long-term vision. Uh, a lot of times I'm willing to sacrifice short-term vision uh, for what I believe is better long-term vision. Um, I'm a true believer that you cannot be a good zone defensive team if you don't understand how to be a good man-to-man -man defensive team. Uh, Sindarius and those guys, their senior year, everyone talked about our man-to-man -man and all that. Yeah, it was good. That zone bailed us out of a lot of problems that year. Um, but we were really good man-to-man. -man. I think this team has grown in its man-to-man -man defense. Someone told me before the A&M game that we actually lead the SEC in field goal percentage defense, um, which I don't, I don't follow those things. I was like, wow, I had no idea, um, which makes me think I always felt that this could be a real good defensive team. Uh, we're fouling too much. Uh, we, and a lot of our fouls are playing behind in the post, reach-ins, uh, when they drive us, uh, overzealous shot blockers, not being vertical, jumping into people, we got to keep cleaning that stuff up. Uh, but I think as we've become better defenders uh, in our man-to-man -man where you're forced to uh, defend the dribble so you don't get destroyed off the bounce, uh, you're forced to understand how to rotate on the backside, uh, you're forced to talk. Because when people come at you, if you don't talk, now two guys help, you're in trouble. So you have to talk. And the guy that talks first, that's who's got the help. And the guy that listens instead of talks has to react based on the voice he heard. Um, and, and that gets a little complicated sometimes. But as we've gotten better there, I think we've become a better zone defensive team. Does that mean we'll play more zone moving forward? I kind of manage that. Based on the game, the game, and my feel, and the opponent. Um, but the zone, no doubt. We don't beat A&M without the zone the other day. Uh, uh, I, thought, I thought our man was pretty good. Uh, but I, we, my fear going into the game was foul trouble, and we got into it. Uh, so then I had to go in earlier, and, uh, and it worked out. You know, the 2-3 zone was good for a while. And then, like I said, they, they got in a little bit of a rhythm getting it into the high post and spacing us and then driving our center from the high post. Um, and, uh, and then give Bruce. That's, that's where staffs are so important. You know, head coaches get too much credit and too much blame sometimes. Uh, you got to have a solid staff. And, you know, Bruce, was, he didn't just sit there and worry about, well, this is not my scout, so I don't have to do too much. On the contrary, he was fully engaged with what uh, was going on and, and willing to even – because then sometimes assistant coaches get their feelings hurt when they give a suggestion and the coach ignores them. Uh, he obviously didn't do that. He, he stayed on me and stayed on me until he, 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 he finally convinced me to try it. Frank, very off topic here, but how do you know Sergeant Slaughter? I didn't, but uh, when, when you're a fan of wrestling, like I tell my wife all the time, like, We'll be sitting on the couch, and I'll just put it on to aggravate her. And she's like, take that off. I said, so you can watch reality TV and I can't? I mean, a <laughs> uh, uh, huge wrestling fan. And uh, uh, Bruce Shingler, uh, the gentleman Paul, um, uh, what's Paul's last name, who's Sergeant Slaughter's agent. Uh, and Bruce struck up a friendship when Bruce lived in Miami. They've remained friends. And uh, Bruce uh, um, came up to me before the couple of days before the game, and he said, "Hey, um, this buddy of mine called me. Uh, they're going to be in the area uh, for um, for something that that uh, some promotion that they were doing." And Sergeant Slaughter loved to come see you guys, see the guys play, and wants to meet you. And I said, "Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me?" 
And uh, so they showed up and they spent the whole day with us, shoot around the game. Um, uh, just uh, 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 we listening to some of the old stories because uh, it's it's I don't know I think it's different I think everything's scripted now you know back when those guys were doing it man that was all impromptu too right? and 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 the 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 interviews the the uh, the performances, uh, you know, thinking you're going to wrestle for five minutes and then being told a minute before your match, no, nah, it's going to be ten minutes. So now you got to figure out what you're going to do for another five minutes. Um, it, uh, those those guys are unbelievable entertainers. Um, um, but I, I had the time of my life hanging out with him. I really did, and and I love listening to stories. I when 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 people have been on the journey. And they, they've seen so much and experienced so much. I love just listening to them share stories. It, it uh, you know, it's it's a whole lot of fun. And uh, and I started telling him about, you know, as a kid going to the Miami Beach Convention Center and seeing championship wrestling from Florida. And we started calling out names. And because that's when he, he started. 1974 was his first match. How about he had a match two years ago at age 69? 69, two years ago. I was like, you're you're insane. He goes, eh, you know, get hit with a chair for a living. <laughs> Something's really screwed up up there. But um, that was awesome. And then when the game ended, he's in the locker room and he grabs me. He says, man, I can't do these games. <laughs> so I said, neither can I. Thanks, guys. <laughs>